This is video of the Apollo Lunar Module taking off. Now, despite the two astronauts being inside it, the camera is somehow managing to tilt up to follow it. How is that possible? Did they take a cameraman along for the ride and leave them there? Or perhaps it really was just shot in a studio? This is in fact the work of RCA's GCTA. What? The Ground Commanded Television Assembly that was designed and produced by RCA for the Apollo 15 and 17 missions. But before we get into the details of how that works, this video is sponsored by Doogie and their new T10 tablet. The brand new Doogie T10 sports a 10.1 inch full HD display as well as a high grade aluminium body. It's powered by a Unisoc octa-core processor and 8GB of RAM. And don't worry if you're always stuck with rubbish Wi-Fi because the T10 has the ability of installing up to two nano SIM cards so that you can always rely on your own data. And with the 8300 milliamp hour battery and fast 18 watt USB Type-C charging, you don't need to worry about the thing always going flat. So if you're in the market for a new tablet and you want good performance at a great price, then why not consider the Doogie T10 by checking out the link in the description down below. RCA were the company that produced the television cameras that had been used for previous Apollo missions, including the camera that recorded the iconic footage of Armstrong coming down the ladder of Apollo 11, with the camera then being mounted on the inside of the Mesa compartment door. Now, with all of the early missions being very cautious about how much time the astronauts spent outside and how far they travelled from the lunar module, the camera would then be detached from the compartment door and placed on a tripod near the lunar module. But it still needed to have a tether cable in order to provide power to the camera and allow the live TV broadcast to be passed back to the lunar module to be transmitted back to Earth. This would at least allow the astronauts to be able to point the camera in different directions to keep a documentation of the work that they were doing. However, things took really quite a leap forward for Apollo 15 with the inclusion of the Lunar Rover vehicle. This would not only allow a means for the astronauts to travel further, but it gave a mobile source of power to take the camera with them. And while they were at it, they thought, well, you know, it's going to be a pain in the rectum to keep having to walk back to the rover to check the camera and reposition it. Can't we just have someone else control it? And so was born the GCTA, which took the television camera and mounted it onto the television control unit. This base unit design essentially forms the basis of the motorized mounts that we see today in photography and video. RCA actually have an extensive 70 odd page assessment that followed Apollo 15 which documented the overall performance as well as areas that they wanted to improve on it for future missions. I mean it's ultimately crazy just how much assessment and documenting and revisions went into every tiny aspect of the Apollo program. But anyway back to the camera itself. So there was a, a cable which ran from the camera into the TCU. Now this would allow power and command signals to be passed into the camera. The TCU itself was fitted with two stepper motors and clutches. One would adjust the tilt of the camera and one would control the pan. Now the TCU was then not only hooked up to the rover's batteries for power, but also its radio system as well, which would allow for command signals to be received from mission control to activate the stepper motors in the base unit and thus move the camera around. We can actually see prime examples of this at work during the EVAs of Apollo 16 and 17. Apollo 16, when John Young is doing his jump salute to the American flag, the camera is initially aiming at the lunar module whilst they get the flag out. We can see small precise movements at first, followed by a constant speed pan around about 180 degrees to where the flag has been placed. We can even see the rover in the background of some of the still images. And then afterwards, it continues to pan around further in that same direction, showing the rover itself, and then finishing a full 360 degree pan back around facing the lunar module. As well as on Apollo 17, with the astronauts closing speeches on the surface, with some parts being moved by the astronauts themselves, but other times the camera is being adjusted whilst both astronauts are in the frame. 
So we know how the camera was able to be moved by mission control, but the question still remains, how were they able to achieve the shot of the lunar module taking off? Well, it's not actually as complicated as you might believe. For starters, we can see from the other video clips that the stepper motors rotate the camera at a single fixed speed. It's not like the operator had to gauge how quickly to move the camera, it was just a case of it was either moving at one speed or it didn't move at all. And the lunar module had a known sort of takeoff speed, so all he really had to do to plan the shot was calculate how far away the camera needed to be placed so that its fixed speed of tilt would match that of the lunar module's ascent. Position too far away, it would move too quickly. Position it too close, the camera wouldn't move quick enough, which is incidentally what happened on Apollo 16. The shot was originally going to be attempted on Apollo 15, but the camera suffered from a faulty clutch, which ruined that attempt. They tried it on Apollo 16, but the rover had been left too close to the lunar module. So whilst it caught the initial takeoff, the lunar module soon went out of frame. Thankfully, they were able to get the shot right for Apollo 17, which was actually the final Apollo mission. Now, in terms of how they got the timing right for controlling the camera, there was a delay between the controls being operated in Houston and the signal being received by the camera on the moon, but this delay was a known figure depending on the time of day. It was around about two seconds, and the lunar module takeoff time was known in advance right down to the second. So all that the shot required, I say all the shot required, was ensuring the camera was positioned the right distance back to match the lunar module's ascent rate, and then the tilt-up command had to be engaged about two seconds before the designated liftoff time. I've actually used similar principles for some of my product review videos in the past. You know, I have a camera moving at a fixed rate on a camera slider, and an object rotating at a fixed speed on a turntable. All that it requires for me to do is to start the slider moving at the right time so that the camera and object sync up as they pass each other. A little bit of planning and timing required, but nothing too extravagant, even when it's being done across the gulf of space. But that is going to wrap this video up. As always, feel free to leave your thoughts in the comments down below. If you enjoyed this video, then do please consider hitting the like and subscribe button if you haven't already done so, and then hopefully we'll see you in the next video.